Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's video is an extract from a fascinating late 19th century periodical I recently came across, The Esoteric. This magazine features a wonderful array of articles, reviews, and poems, all written in a magnificent High Victorian style. Tonight's extract comes from the July 1895 edition. It's by T.A. Williston, and it's entitled Mind, Mundane and Celestial. I hope you enjoy it. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. The faculty of mind, or the process of thought formation, is most wonderful. So wonderful is it that speech is inadequate to express its mystery. There are two minds, the mundane and the celestial. The mundane mind, working through material structure of men and animals, creates from the elements found in their organism physical bodies without volition on the part of the animal acted upon. When man has developed strong intellectual powers, the mundane mind that works through him is governed by and absolutely obeys the dictates of his mind. The strongly intellectual and spiritual man builds a body according to his needs. The animal man has an organism created for him, and that organism, created from his passions and appetites, can perceive nothing beyond the animal senses and desires. The powers possessed by a highly developed intellectual man make him a conscious thinking entity, a living, godlike creature, one so far above the present race of men that in comparison to him, our most brainy men are but newborn children. Mind is the connecting link between man and his creator. It is the wonderful and almost unknown factor which, when governed by the will, enables man to gain spiritual powers, permitting him to rise above material conditions, freeing him from the limitation of flesh, giving him control of the finer and most potent elements of nature, so changing him from an animal to a son of God. Man, when he has gained an understanding of the hidden laws of his being, begins to work through and by the subtle powers of mind. When he reaches this state, the promise that he will be a creator is fulfilled. No longer need he earn his bread in the sweat of his brow, for, by the potency of the mind that he has developed, he is able to create from the seeming void and bring into material manifestation the things needed. The mundane mind differs from the celestial or universal mind. The celestial mind fills the universe and is a great ocean of unformed thought. The mundane mind is the mind of our planet Earth. This has been separated from the ocean of mind by the will of the Creator, who endowed it with certain powers that will enable it to work with, without certain specific ultimates. All thoughts that have ever been formed by man are stored in it. All knowledge that has ever been worked out on our planet is reflected here, and can and will eventually be used by the souls that are now making spiritual attainments. Nothing that has ever been on earth is really lost, but is safely stored, awaiting the advent of those who possess the mind powers to force themselves into the great arcana of God. Man, as he is found in our age, is, as yet, unborn into the realm of mind. He does not know how to use the powers with which he is endowed. If man had reached a degree of unfoldment in which he could use the powers, 
that now lie dormant within him, he would be free from all the animal propensities that ally him to the physical world, and bind him within the narrow confines of the five senses. If he could use the powers of mind, he would not be the animal that he now is, for by that power he could send forth thoughts endowed with energy to which the materials of earth would respond. He would be like his father, a creator, one having the ability to command, with a consciousness that his commands would be obeyed. When man, through soul unfoldment, is capable of penetrating the realm of the celestial mind, he will be able to form thoughts of a character such as to give him power transcending anything that we, in our present state of development, can imagine. Few, if any, upon our earth today are able to touch this realm. Could we do so, we would think the thoughts that God thinks. If we could think from that wondrous realm, time and space would be annihilated. We would be a conscious part of the whole universe and would know what is transpiring in the most distant sun as readily as we know what is going on around us. We would be familiar with both the past and the future. We would dwell continually in the eternal now. The most profound thinker at the present time lives and thinks wholly in the mundane mind, which is the mind power governing our earth and which controls all animal life. All worlds float, as it were, in a sea of mind or thought, yet the mind that ensphere[s] them is not that of the great ocean of unformed thought which is the mind of God, but a part of it, into which the creator of the universe has imaged thought. Man, being wholly under the control of this thought, it is most difficult for him to rise above it, and until he does so, he will be continually thinking thoughts that have been formed by others. As long as he thinks thoughts already formed, so long will he remain under the control of the anima mundi. In the beginning, God formed a thought in the celestial mind, and willed it forth to accomplish certain results. This thought becomes the mind that produces a world, and is the power that governs all that belongs to that planet. The ruling power implanted in this mind is that of generation, and for this reason, all animal life, being governed by this mind, manifests a desire to reproduce its kind, thereby working out the thought of God expressed to an underdeveloped world. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. It being the desire of all animal life to express the mind that thinks through it, this mind being the mundane, and its chief thought that of generation, it is most difficult for man to rise above it and enter the spiritual state. In fact, none can unless they have developed soul power, and a consciousness of that interior will which gives to them the ability to rise above and step outside of the controlling influence of the mundane. We have said that, in the beginning, the Creator expressed from the unformed ocean of mind, which is Himself, a deific thought and formed it for a specific purpose. That purpose was to create a world and people it. The power of that thought is continually present moulding all life, in order that nature may work in complete harmony with the expressed purpose of the mind that created it. The ultimate for which men labour and struggle is to develop spiritual powers, so that they may rise above the control of the planetary mind and be superior to the thought of generation expressed in it. As long as the mundane mind thinks through man and thus dominates him absolutely, he is little superior to the animals. He is not a free agent, but is governed by forces over which he has no control. He possesses only animal instinct and is incapable of forming correct 
orderly thoughts. For is it possible to be capable of ordinary intellection when one's thoughts have not been created by himself, but have been formed by a mind outside of his organism? The mundane mind, falsely called the astral, being a vast storehouse of formed thoughts, is accessible to all who are sufficiently sensitive to reach it. We find, therefore, very many animal men and women posing before the world as highly developed and gifted spiritual beings. They, through planetary conditions, are very sensitive and are therefore able to reach into this storehouse and gather the thoughts that are stored there. To hear them on the rostrum, an uninitiate would believe that they are endowed with spiritual gifts, while, in fact, they are but empty vessels through which the thoughts of others flow. This is the power of inspiration or recalling, and is much to be desired by all, for by it we are able to recollect, and the knowledge that the wise of all ages have gathered and formulated in thought. Being able to gather this knowledge, we can send it forth strengthened and endowed with added potency drawn from our own life qualities. This, however, is but the beginning of the ultimate for which we struggle. It is not the highest platform upon which the tr truly spiritual man will stand. When man has gained true spiritual unfoldment, he will be able to penetrate beyond the mind of the mundane. He will be able to reach out into the heretofore unexplored realm of unformed thought, and to form, from the qualities of that mind, thoughts that only the sons of God can think. And so he will be able to express what has never before found its way to earth. He will build from these thoughts an organism transcending anything that the earth has heretofore produced, an organism wholly builded to serve the needs of the spiritual man, a body endowed with willpower drawn from Yahweh himself. This divine will permits man to do and accomplish the designs of his creator, which is to elevate upon a spiritual platform not only individuals, but races. O oh mind, thou mighty divine factor in moulding human life, will earth's children ever understand thy wonderful power? Thou, most unknowable, most powerful, most subtle agent of the Creator, who can fathom thy mysterious workings? Will we ever know from whence thou comest or what thou art? Is there no means whereby we may touch, sense, or handle thee? Is it within the province of thy learning, men of science, to demonstrate that such a thing exists? You, who have laboured long and patiently in the laboratory, can you not throw some light upon this subject, which is of such vital import to the human race? Can you harness it and make it obedient to your desires? Alas, no, for to understand mind, one must have a spiritual perception. To realize it in fullness would be to understand God, to have access to all knowledge and power. Lightly we speak of intellect and mind, and point with pride to our statesmen and scientists, and hold in worshipful reverence those who have the power to sway principalities and to rule nations. The greatest statesman who is today on earth, the most learned scientist, and the most profound thinker, is but a babe compared to the souls who rule by and through the power of mind. As yet, our most learned professors and deepest scientific thinkers have not doffed the swaddling clothes of ignorance. They still sleep on Mother Nature's bosom, helpless and unable to grasp intelligently the power of the mind that commands and is obeyed. No one can comprehend mind or can realize that such a realm exists until he has passed beyond the power of evolution. 
no one can enter the realm of mind or gain access to the more subtle agencies of nature until he rises to the apex of soul unfoldment where evolution and involution meet. That is to say, evolution carries all creation from a lower to a higher state of existence. Involution carries spirit from a higher to a lower state. It causes spirit to descend through matter, while evolution causes spirit to ascend through matter to spirit. The involuntary forces can be compared to ever-flowing currents that run through the great ocean of the mundane mind, carrying in their flow germs of spiritual life. Many of these germs have never been limited by being ensphered by thought, and are unrestrained only insofar as they obey the universal mind that controls these forces. These evolutionary currents carry these unensphered germs along in their onward flow until they find embodiment in the centre of a thought, which thought is substance composed of the life essence of the one that sent it forth, willed it into being. When the germ has been ensphered by the creative thought, it becomes limited or separated from the great ocean of unlimited spirit. The power of the creative thought crystallised it, as it were, and builded it for a material covering. This material covering is its physical body, which is thought crystallised. To ensphere does not change the spiritual germ, but when it becomes ensphered, its action is limited, and it at once begins to struggle upward towards the source from which it originally came. It is now controlled wholly by the evolutionary currents which carry it upward, until, through generations of rebirth, it lies at the centre of a human, spiritually developed soul. When the spirit germ has become the centre of a spiritual man or woman, the forces of evolution and involution meet, forming a circle which is constantly flowing downward and upward. When man reaches the apex of this circle, he is ready for the new birth. He has gained experience and soul powers that enable him to control and use the mind powers that make him like unto his creator. If he should refuse to do this, he will at once be caught in the descending current and be carried downward until the soul disintegrates. The former experiences all lost and the ego is once more compelled to find expression through the lowest forms of animal or perhaps vegetable existence. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. These words were spoken by one who knew whereof he spoke, and therefore it behooves all who feel that they have developed to where they can use their mind powers and live from the intellect to be no longer animals, but to step from under the control of generation, the animal powers that today rules man. There are many such in the world, men and women, who have, through evolutionary development, reached this period of their soul's unfoldment. They find themselves in a world surrounded by friends and acquaintances, yet strangers in a strange land. Their loves and desires are unlike those of their associates, and they feel that there is something higher and nobler to live for than the gratification of the senses. To this class we appeal, to those strangers in a world of friends. These thoughts are sent forth with a silent prayer that they may have the wisdom to understand what is best for them to do, that they may earnestly try to develop the spirit of true devotion, which, if persistently carried on, will bring them very close to God so close, indeed, that they will know the Father's will, and be in a condition to be led into a haven of rest and sunshine. If you once start on the road that leads to spiritual consciousness, and have determined to follow the leadings of the Spirit, 
having turned your face from the world and determined to find truth, loiter not by the wayside, for if you do, you may, perchance, be beguiled into playing with the apparently beautiful blossoms that man's idealized, perverted senses have planted in your path to deceive and mislead. Beware of these chimeras. Their colors may appear most beautiful, their fragrance most alluring. Remember this. Beautiful though they may appear, cunningly hidden beneath each blossom is a serpent's sting. A sting that has brought into the world untold misery and sorrow. If you should escape this sting, the deadly, seductive aroma of these flowers will destroy the growth of the soul and will bring to you death instead of eternal life, the greatest of all boons that God the Father has vouchsafed to man, the Son. If we would force ourselves through the realm of superstition and materialism and enter the realm of mind, we must put our whole trust in God, confiding, trusting, even as little children. We are conscious that before we can enter this wisdom realm, we must, through sorrow and pain, pierce the black clouds of ignorance, which for ages have been gathering about our earth, shrouding her in a night of sorrow and sin. But, thank God, the night is almost past. A new cycle of time has come to earth. Even now, the glad hosannas of the angel world can be heard, and the breaking of the new and brighter day is even now tinging the eastern sky with light, a sure token that the goddess of wisdom is bringing to earth happiness and peace.